This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Laura Mandel, professor of English at Texas A&M University and director of the Center of Digital Humanities Research, or CODHR. The CODHR supports a dazzling array of digital humanities projects in the areas of digital development and, <clears throat> very importantly, in multidisciplinary research and publication in the digital humanities. Among her many contributions to scholarship is her monograph, or better, her manifesto entitled Breaking the Book, which works to reveal why there remains a resistance to the digital humanities in traditional humanities disciplines. But of most immediate interest to this program is the CODHR's agreement through Laura to become the publisher of the new Variorum Shakespeare. Even in long form, we are only able to scratch the surface of the many and multifarious contributions that Laura has made to the digital humanities and to literary study. But we can at least provide a view of the innovative interface of the new Variorum Shakespeare and a look at how this project will develop as the premier open source digital site for the works of Shakespeare. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Laura, I cannot express how happy we are to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Now, Laura, your work, I've been going over your work, and it kind of kept me up a little bit because you contain multitudes, as we say, and uh, you're all over uh, it, everything from, I mean, even the sciences in co combination with the humanities, and we break it down, and uh, there's a whole meta structure to your entire career, which we're going to talk about in terms of technology and setting up meta structures, but uh, we, we'll get to that in a moment, but hot now is the Shakespeare Variorum. And I wanted to start out by talking about the Shakespeare Variorum and what you folks and a lot of people are doing collectively to bring us these uh, exquisite online text. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I will share my screen with you if that's okay. Uh-huh. So um, I can show you the new Variorum Shakespeare. Um, my center, the Center of Digital Humanities Research, uh, at Texas A&M received a grant from the Modern Language Association to take over publication of the new Variorum Shakespeare series. And um, that helped us develop an interface for readers. That money, it paid for that. Um, the, the agreement is that these will all be completely open access, completely free. So any Shakespeare scholar anywhere in the world can get access to these editions. Uh, online. And it's at newvariorumshakespeare.org. And we're slowly getting editions up as they are completed by editors and then encoded. The encoding takes a while, but with newer editions, as editors come on, they will actually use the digital environment to, to develop the Variorum editions. That will speed things up for them in terms of process. And it will mean that when they're done, it's already encoded. So um, that is going to change. Right now we have two editions live, The Winter's Tale and A Midsummer Night's Dream. We're having more that are coming available soon, including King Lear in December of 2022. Very good. Uh, let's take a look at the winner's tale. And so the um, audience can see the interface that is being used in something. about. Well, I thought I'd introduce you to what to do when you get to the site. Yeah. So when you come to the new Very Orm Shakespeare homepage and click on the digital editions, you'll see the list of digital editions available. And if you 
uh, highlight one, you'll see what you can get to. You can get to the very warm reader, the front matter, the bibliography, or the appendix. So these are structured just like the print volumes were. And in fact, everything except the very warm reader is just like the print edition. Um, you would click on a page and go to the front matter. You would click on, on this link and go to the bibliography or click on this link and go to the appendices. Mm -hmm. um, but the very warm reader itself is not the way it is in print. That's where we've made use of the digital to make things um, more easily understandable in a very warm edition. And I hope that's what's happened. Um, so um, if I wanted to say, I think the video you're talking about, if you click on NVS Invo, Info at the homepage, you'll see how to digital NVS. And um, that page has a video there that shows you exactly what I'm showing you now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is the very warm reader and it's split into three panes. You can see here, this is the play text. And these are all the textual notes, but they've um, re been reconfigured in the digital environment as a histogram. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. And these are the contextual notes. And you can see that the play text is highlighted whenever there's a contextual note available. And you just click on the highlight to get to that contextual note. Uh, sorry commentary note is what okay. I should say, the commentary mm -hmm. note. And the commentary notes are as they were in the print editions, um, you know, the editors talking about specific parts of the of the play. And they may in these commentary notes um, cite um, particular um, editions, um, particular bibliographic items, uh, this is an edition, this is a bibliographic item, and they may in fact cite lines of the play that are elsewhere in the play from where the commentary note is. When you click on those links, a little pop-up takes you to that. And if you click on the arrow, you actually go to the place in the bibliography where that is, go to the um, collated edition bibliography or go to the lines in the play. Um, these are called little disclosure triangles, and this one is open. These are closed. Mm -hmm. If I click on the, the, the disclosure triangle to open it, I see all the variations. Now, what's highlighted in yellow goes to a commentary note, um, but here, what's highlighted in orange has changed. So you can see that he has, uh, has been changed to he hath, in these um, witnesses. Yes, okay. <laughs> this now, is hardcore scholarship here, but uh, that's what we do. And that's what that's, many of, that's what this is for. That's right. And, um, but when you click on that little box there, um, it tells you all the editions that have that variant in it. Mm -hmm. And you can see them all. Um, so it's a way to see, you know, some editions will have a different variants and it's a way to see what those are either individually or if there's a number of them that follow that variant, all of them. Yes. Until you work with it hands on, it might look a little bit foreboding. And also the, the histogram, what, what you we're talking about for particularly my students is we're talking about uh, hundreds of years of history of Shakespeare editions that are not the same. There are many variants from edition to edition. And what a variorum does is it picks up all of those. And that might not matter to you. So you don't have to worry about it. But then again, on the right hand side, you're dealing with uh, explication and bringing more meaning to these lines that are from an, our, a time that we didn't live in. You know, we don't know a lot about horses. So references to uh, halters and that sort of thing, you can get definitions. And also you can go to the other scholars who have illuminated these lines. And also you can just read the text. Uh, so yes, please go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, I was sort of presuming people knew what variorum editions are. And um, in print, you know, they can, they're huge and very costly to produce. So each one of these editions printed by the Modern Language Association, which took over, I believe, in the 1930s or 40s of publishing them, yeah. each one of those costs like $600. Uh -huh. um, it ends up being it's the, the a lifetime of scholarship mm -hmm. to go through all the witnesses, all the editions of Shakespeare's plays that are significant that have been published since 
from Shakespeare's lifetime to our own and look at how editors have interpreted these lines and understood what the correct text should be. And um, they differ. They differ substantially because we don't have original manuscripts. Yeah. Um, we have various sources and they differ. So it's very um, it's it's an editorial decision. Yeah, and I'm going to get something. Uh, one of my favorite. Sorry, one of my favorite. This is Harold Jenkins, a version, famous version of Hamlet. And of course, th this was, if not a lifetime's work, it was a large, it had to be a large portion of his work. Uh, and what this is doing is this is integrating not only this text, uh, it's bringing everything to the fore where you can bring it up with a click and, uh, and, and makes it far more usable as a uh, research device, as even for readers who are doing very close reading of the text and maybe writing a paper. Uh, and uh, as much as I love this book and, and others, Ann Thompson's and, and other, uh, you know, great uh, print editions, they can be used side by side. You know, if you if you enjoy holding the book, as, as you and I both do, uh, we'll get to breaking the book later. But uh, uh, so please, please continue. <laughs> so um, the, <clears throat> the, you know, the printed book is wonderful. You do have to flip a lot of pages to figure things out. Um, and this means you don't have to flip through those pages, this interface to figure those things out. You just click and you find out about them. Um, but also it allows you to do searches that you can't do with the printed book. So for instance, if you want your students to search in modern English for the phrase sleepy drinks in the winter's tale, um, you will find even in the folio um, spelling those instances where sleepy drinks are discussed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to find all the lines spoken by Paulina in The Winter's Tale, you search for Paul, you know, however it's abbreviated, and you will, you will find all 46 um, speeches that she has uh, and be able to move through them. This histogram here, you can see, uh, sorry, this it's uh, what we call a mini map. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it's got orange, that's where those search returns are. So you can click around the play to see all those search returns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Eventually, we're going to have it so that you can have the, the search returns in the, the reader view, but you can also have a, a, a graph view where you can see which scenes and how much uh, Paulina is speaking, um, or a list view where you can just get a list of all Paulina's speeches. So it enables um, searching through not only The Winter's Tale and the other um, edition, not only each individual edition, but all of the editions together as well. Uh, that's something that the print editions can't, can't do for you. Right. If that makes sense. Yes. A book is still the best technology ever for reading. Um, but what can digital technology do that you can't do in print? That's what we're interested in, in, in fostering. Yes. Well, I could talk with you for hours just about the interface because we could go into what's well, we we could go behind the interface, and I did wanted to want to add that you are using a uh, time proven, a vintage uh, uh, encoding uh, called TEI text encoding initiative, which uh, has a long history, certainly from the '90s, but I think it even even before then. But uh, the, you know, so those of uh, our viewers who are not into digital humanities, one of the problems is that uh, sometimes coding and scripting time out. They're not used. And uh, they <clears throat> and, uh, and, and new new things are developed and these scripts are not cross platform capable and everything has to be broken down and rebuilt. Right. Is that is that correct? Right. So yeah. TEI is actually a code that is a platform and program agnostic. So there were too many digital editions built in the 90s mm -hmm. that were created for equipment that we can no longer run, yeah. you know, uh, so certain CD-ROMs that are no longer usable. Um, and then um, in addition to that, some of them are encoded 
in code that's proprietary. And what that means is, you know, uh, if a, a company no longer makes a, an interface for their code, um, then then you can't see it anymore. You can't use it anymore. Right. So TEI is agnostic and it allows you to create what we would call an archival quality copy of your digital edition. Um, all of the TEI code encodes all of the work of the editor that the editors have done. And then that gets preserved forever um, on library servers as they as the future goes on and it's human readable code. So even there's no program that anybody needs to know in order to be able to use this. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's, um, you know, the sustainability plan. In other words, if, um, if in, you know, 2,500, we're inserting chips in our brain to read, people will still be able to read the new Very Orm Shakespeare's. <laughs> yes, yes, just like we can read things that were printed 500 years ago. We exactly. forget that, that is, you know, a technology too. Well, I love this because it goes into a uh, kind of cathedral model for me, uh, like any me medieval cathedral or like the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona or whatever. The the people who started it knew they would not live to see the end of it. And I'm, I'm sure that this Very Orm, when it was started by Furness in the late 19th century he knew that he wasn't going to live to see the end of it his son takes it over there, there's your sustainability just keep it yes. in the family you know like a, yes. a, a wine a vineyard uh, or whatever uh and his son continued and he knew he would not see the end of it and the mla took it over and it was taken over pretty much in the after the 30s i think uh, by professionals uh, who you know uh, career people who said this is what we're going to do and it has been, it, it is that it is, uh, it's going to take a long time to build, but as it goes digital, you have assured in that step, you and your team and the people you're working with in collaboration have assured that a hundred years from now that we, this work being done, this annotated work, it doesn't die with the code you That's know, right. going That's obsolescing right. or being proprietary or whatnot. This is open access code. Uh, now, I'm interested, too, I'm going to get a little techy and then pull back because I don't want to lose too many people. But uh, a lot of this has to do it. This takes a lot of person power to to build these things and to make these links. And I don't know exactly. I can't tell from looking uh, how much you're going to be able to pull stuff automatically uh, with um well, I, I guess the the right type of XML encoding, and I think you guys are working both with X, XML and um, uh, JSON uh, or JSON uh, scripts. It's a kind of joke out there, how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, JSON, Sorry. you know, make it French. Uh, <laughs> scripting and uh, and how that language is developed, perhaps to perform. Um, uh, machine, uh, well, AI, but um, maybe not quite the type of AI we see on Google, but uh, pulling things so you don't need quite so many people building the links. Uh, how is yes. that working now? And so you're I working with the uh, Texas A&M, I'm sure people over there who know a huge lot more than I do about uh, co encoding. So is is that kind of thing happening? Yes, if I could share my screen, because I was yeah, going to get do to again. that part. The, this is all the front end that you're seeing here, all the views that the reader has. Yeah. And of course, as you said, the digital editions themselves exist in TEI code, which I won't show you here. It's um, a little bit hard to read. And these are so complex. Uh, each one has about five or six TEI files that goes into it. Um, so we had the first two professionally encoded by Julia Flanders, who's one of the founders of the TEI um, consortium, which you can go to. It's at tei-c.org. And um, she participated from the very beginning. It began at Vassar in the 80s. Um, and uh, so- In the this, 80s, in the 80s. Yes. yes. So- um, she designed the code for these editions. So that's why we trust it. And we're going to keep uh, encoding everything in TEI. So how does that work? I mean, 
here so far, editors have been given, I have to say, a huge manual for how to create a Variorum edition. And then they have you know, done it in Word or, you know, on three by five cards or however they've had to do it. Um, it's It takes a lifetime. It takes 40 years sometimes to create one of these editions. So we've gotten some in Word, Microsoft Word, and then Julia Flanders was paid by the Modern Language Association to encode those in TEI. And Coder was given those there was one left. And so some of that award money from the Modern Language Association went for, again, Julia Flanders to encode that, um, in take that Word document and encode it in TEI. Well, now my team at Coder here has to do it. And um, so the issue is, let's imagine a clean break. Let's say, okay, nobody had any work done after the ones that we've got TEI encoded, which is not true. And now we're going forward with editors who are just beginning to work on, you know, to, to do the research for their very warm edition. Yes. They're going to use what, what, what we have created called, it's a data set studio and it's called Corpora. And um, this is the interface to Corpora and each one will have, um, there will be um, an NVS um, corpus, but there will also be a corpus for each edition. And what so what you're seeing here is an interface that readers and users don't see. This is what the editors are going to use to create their digital editions. And theoretically, we should be able to speed it up because we have OCR and we can OCR the witnesses that they're going to use. Now, I should say for each edition, there is 100 witnesses uh -huh. and or more. And um, that also... Uh, OCRing um, uh, is not so easy for early modern texts. And um, so we um, have created in Corpora an interface where um, the OCR text can be matched up with and corrected, um, but also matched up with line through line numbers uh, in witnesses. And um, this will allow the software automatically behind the scenes if each witness, there, the OCR is fixed and the through line number is assigned, then the software corpora can automatically generate all of the differences in the lines uh, that um, the editor would want to see. Well, and that's, huge. Editor, that's huge. That's huge. That's huge. That's, that's the difference work. between having a spade and having a backhoe <laughs> or even more. The gap is yeah, a backhoe that goes down there and packs up all the dirt in nice, neat little blocks. Yeah, you know? automatically without yes. without a driver. Yes. Right. Now, it takes more work on the front end because you've got to OCR all these witnesses and you've got to yeah. assign through line numbers with them. But yeah. ideally, that that is what will be done. And so then editors can work with that as they decide what are substant substantive um, you know, variations and what are just accidentals and should be ignored and all the things they do in the process of editing. <laughs> so um, in and what our corpora will do is as they work on their edition, it'll give them forms <coughs> and tools for create for building their edition. And then it will generate the TEI that is necessary for the document to live forever. I see. I see. Uh, okay, so to uh, to make it uh, on the in the simplest terms, uh, what is, what's happening here is you're building code on the front end that uh, that works on its own after it gets built to save hours and hours of labor, and one of the one of the great challenges for digital humanities is that we are not in Silicon Valley. We cannot go down to an angel investor and borrow, um, I don't know, a zillion dollars and have them wait for, for five or more years for us to show how we can turn a profit and make everybody else billionaires along with us. We just don't have that. And then bring in a team of programmers working 24-7 uh, to build these things. We don't have that. And and then this very orum will be open access. It will not generate income. I think there will be secondary income. I think people once it's it, you know once it's built, they will come. The money will come, right? And that's the way it's going to have to happen. 
but um, uh, graduate students by name graduate. And then you have to train another, I'm doing this right now with a very small project. And uh, <clears throat> so that these are the things that get in the way. The, the, the things that you're talking about here uh, add to sustainability. The <laughs> next person that comes in after these graduate students go on to their careers, uh, or some of them may be hired, some of them may stay and, and be part of well, the Well, I have to tell time. you, Coder's a little different that way. And I'll explain it in the way um, uh, Coder resembles um, IATH, which is where I first started becoming a digital humanist. IATH was, as far as I know, the first digital humanity center in this country, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities at the University of Virginia. And IATH has permanent staff, and so does Coder. So we actually have a permanently assigned um, project manager for the new Variorum Shakespeare. Currently, this is uh, Dr. Kathy Tarabi. She's um, an instructional um, associate professor at Texas A&M University. So her service time to the university is um, to be the project manager of the new Variorum Shakespeare. So um, we are not losing her and not losing her knowledge. Additionally, Coder has a programmer on staff and he's the one who built Corpora and he's the one who wrote the script that takes the TEI that Julia Flanders developed it and puts it into Corpora so that it can give the readers that front end because there's also that pipeline, right? Here's the TEI and it goes to, into Corpora and through Python magic then is projected into the HTML and JSON that you see on the front end. So, um, there, there, there will be continuous support and we don't have to worry about the graduate student problem. In fact, we had just had to take over a project because they had a graduate student problem. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right about that. But Coder is more firmly established and a little bit more like IAF than some digital humanity centers, which is why I think we you know, were awarded the bid to host the new Very Orm Shakespeare. Yes. Yes, and it's institutionally uh, assigned, meaning it's at Texas A&M, and I really can't think of a better place, uh, <clears throat> and that's given the people, and that's also given the institution and uh, its history, uh, so the uh, this is where it should be happening, and uh, so I want to move a little bit beyond uh, the technical, we'll, we'll, we will re return, but talk a little bit more about the Shakespearean element here, and your your first love, humanistic love, is with uh, women authors in the 18th century. Of course, 18th century studies and women authors. One of my loves in my graduate training was 18th century, and I shifted over. I, I shifted over to Shakespeare. A long, well, long story, but uh, <clears throat> I love that era, and. Let's see, I'm not following the agenda, but I want to get to a little bit more to Laura right now, because I, I can see that we could go forever on the projects that you are doing, that you're over, that you have initiated, that you're developing. Uh, and I wanted to get to your humanistic side and this uh, idea that you started out with uh, women in the 18th century and a site that I uh, just now am a, a, a new fan of your site. I had no idea that there was so much there. So tell us a little bit about that, the, the website, and also your background as an 18th century specialist. Yes, well, so as an 18th century specialist, the first thing I did is um, to um, <clears throat> create um, a website uh, so that people could get access to non-canonical texts written by women from the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Poetess Archive, and it's at poetessarchive.org. Yes. It's about to be re-released in a new um, interface. Yes. Um, and um, it contains a lot of poetry by women or men writing in the poetess tradition. And also, we're about to add novels by women and a few other things. Yes. That's where I started. And when um, I first started, I, I was invited to participate um, at the University of Virginia, at their Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities, or IAF, with my project um, to help construct 
a 19th century um, group of scholars who would peer review all these digital projects mm -hmm. so that I would be able to get um, tenure for my Poetess archive. Yes. Um, that didn't happen for the Poetess archive, but I got tenure for a book. Um, <laughs> but um, it did get me promoted to full professor because of the peer review through nines.org, which yes. still exists. Yes, so, um, I saw I saw that, and you have a 2012 article which uh, everybody in our world should read, and then we should think more about it. But please go ahead. Yes. So, um, yes. So then, nines um, then uh, you know didn't have any have much 18th century materials on it. So I created 18th Connect. Yeah. Uh, dot org. And that, that now has in it Ebo and Echo, yeah. as well as a, a tool where you can correct the OCR for that. Right. So the e Ebo is early English books online that goes uh, basically from the uh, 15th century, 16th, 17th, up to what's called the long 18th century, where we move into Echo. And then Nines is 19th century. These are enormous databases with books that have been um, OCR'd. They've been scanned in a way that makes them machine. Uh, <clears throat> you can search them through, uh, you can do digital searches of certain words with a host of problems, of course, with the difference in printings and Fs that looks look like Ss and all of the things that we've seen. But what a, a great leap forward, right? Uh, part of that furnace tradition is uh, William Baldwin, I think it's first name, Baldwin, uh, uh, and Shakespearean education, you see back in the 40s, 30s, of people who spent their whole life going through archives and libraries, doing things that could be done in really initially a few hours of searching now. Uh, so it is a great leap forward, isn't it? Uh, yes. and I, want, I don't want to leave the, um, the tenure and promotion conversation. Uh, I want to first say that Shakespeare in many ways is an 18th century phenomenon. Yes. <laughs> Without the 18th century, and you saw in your list of editors, you see these familiar names, Johnson oh, and Pope yes. and Theobald and Stevens, and you know, the, the whole list of a canon of Mount Rushmore with extra faces of Shakespearean editors that kept that name in play in print. And of course, there's a great 18th century theater tradition working with it, but it became the industry. It is commercial in industry in the 18th century, well long before it became part of the academic world. Um, That's right. I think yeah. Michael Dobson has written a book about this. Yes. And of course, as an 18th century scholar, um, Tybalt's attack on Pope's Shakespeare edition, uh, Hamlet, his book, um, uh, uh, Tybalt's book called Shakespeare Restored, yeah. uh, is is by some considered the beginning of modern editing. Yeah. In other words, Tybalt was saying to Pope, <laughs> Pope's, Pope just thought, oh, you know, Shakespeare's meter is off here. I'll just fix it <laughs> and change right. the word, you know? Yeah. And Tybalt said to, to Pope, no, you've got to figure out what word Shakespeare wanted. Don't <laughs> fix it. Yeah, and, and then that's that, another argument about authorial intentionality, you know, when we get into post-structural reasoning. But it's great stuff. It keeps us, it keeps things going. That's right. right? So um, Tybalt is kind of, and and for his efforts, Pope um, made Tybalt um, king of the dunces and the dunce he had. <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah. Is that the one or is it Mac Fleck note uh, where the uh, uh, the parodied person is flushed down this giant toilet? I, it's, I can't I remember. Think it's, yeah, but they're, they're, I mean, these guys were just crazy. Uh, were, crazy funny. Crazy. You know, when yes. you get when you finally get the joke, it's kind of a way homer, as we say. You have to kind of think through it because it's in what uh, heroic couplets very often. Uh, but yeah. yeah yes, that, but uh, the Dunciad does a great job of actually parodying all the work that the, the very Orem editors are doing. Yeah, that's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> and, you know, he sees it as pedantry, the pedantry of the moderns. And it's our pe pedantry that we've inherited. And we care about it and we do it still. So, yeah. um, you know, that's uh, what the Pope didn't get. He was on the wrong side of history with that one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, you know, he's just so brilliant. 
Uh, we think of the 18th century, and you are exactly right in your career, we think of it as a man's world, right? And we think of these men as uh, some of them from very humble. Johnson, Johnson's a, a, almost a historical error that he ever became, yes. isn't it? I, I mean, the, the, they they were they were driven you know they were they were not born with silver silver spoons not all of them and uh and then the women producing things of course behind the scenes because it had to be that way you've discovered a um, and have expanded the scope of what we consider literary production what we consider um so something to consider to things to go over as l literature people Right. Yes. Whether yes. Uh, and you and the and ceramics and um, arts and crafts and and those kinds of things, which if you look at it and you cross reference it, uh, feed into all of the things literary. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Well, you know, um, Roger Lonsdale made an edition of 18th century women poets, the Oxford edition. Yeah. And um in the beginning, you know, he in his um, introduction, he says, whenever I would tell anybody what I was doing, um, I was uh, when I would say I was editing an, uh, an anthology of 18th century women poets, he'd say uh, that they would always respond, well, were there any? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there there were there were quite a few. So um, just making sure that their texts are available um, for people to see and find is the goal of the Poetess Archive. So um, Mary Leaper's two volumes of poetry will be, be released um, on the, the new um, version of the site, which is coming out at the beginning of 2023. Um, so, you know, all of the um, poetry that um, people don't know about having been written, if you can get it online and you can get it in digital form and you can get it in, moreover, in archival quality digital form, it not only will persist um, in in the world of the digital, um, but it will also um, be used by text miners. And then that work gets taken up into the results, which makes the results much less biased, ideally. Yeah. When you combine this sort of thing, I want to talk about gender, remind me, and gender formation and identification that has these 17th, 18th century roots and the things that you're doing. But uh, when... Uh, you're you're talking about uh, women and the canon and what is effaced by our traditional print uh, ways and traditional scholarship, the way we form canons, right? When you bring the visual in, that is helpful to men and women and anybody who is doing artistic work, things that we are considering literary and things that uh, break down some of the boundaries between uh, what is print literary. I'm thinking specifically of William Blake that you studied and I studied uh, anthologies of poetry and uh, introductions to literature uh, back in another century. And uh, we came across William Blake and next to Shelley, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright just didn't seem to hold up, hold up right? Uh, it just seems like kind of... And you just don't get Blake without the visualization. And how many of us had access to the Bodleian and a you know a first edition of Blake's work or any of those many things that are just brilliant? And that's what you guys have been doing uh, in your OCR, not just bringing forth searchable text, but also visualizing images and the uh, in, the aggregation and integration of all of these things where we can see the whole picture. Yes. Yes, you know, the, the Blake Archive uh, at blakearchive.org um, allows you to see every single version of every single illuminated manuscript that Blake printed from his copper plates because all of them are hand um, watercolor painted and so they differ. So you can compare, uh, there are 14 editions of Songs of Innocence and of Experience you can see the images that he painted for each particular one. And there are huge differences. If you look at something like the Song of Experience, a poison tree, you'll see huge differences in the way he painted those, those plates, the, the um, illustrations on those plates. And it makes an, an interpretive difference. Uh, and, and one of them, you see a body lying under a tree, which is literally what the poem talks about. 
In another one, the body isn't really visible. It looks like the tree root, but if you look closely, you can see a face. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm really muddying the waters of who this foe is and how this foe uh -huh. came to be uh, uh -huh. in, an, in an interpretation. And of course, to, to see that, you would have had to be able to fly to the Huntington, to the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge, to J, uh, uh, to the Morgan in in New York City to see each individual hand painted copy, and the Blake Archive has photographed all those, put them online, and made them available for the first time in history. We can actually compare them all. And these, I'm assuming, are triple IF compliant images that are part of that uh, framework and uh, yes. various uh, manifests that are put in to, to play at these museums. Now, I guess people are working to do that and you can bring them into uh, your, they, these are open source. And so on your, uh, on any, anybody's uh, web page uh, or platform, whatever, you can bring these images in, they're shareable and have them to share with your students with uh, to, for your own research. And also, I, I hate to say this, but you can see them better than you can see them on a, in a printed wood. You can, mm -hmm. you can zoom and that matters to so many people. Artists, Absolutely. history of print people, print and publication. Well, uh, paleographers with handwriting. Oh my. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's stunning how clear uh, these images uh, become and how what you can see. Now, the Blake Archive was developed before long before AAAF servers. It was developed yeah. in the 90s by IATH. But everything that we do um, has uh, all of the witnesses, the Shakespeare images of witnesses, which will come from the Hadi Trust or from IIIF servers um, that specific libraries have um, will be on a IIIF server, either ours or theirs. And so you're absolutely right. Then they're freely available and people can share them. Yeah. And I guess to make it easy for our, uh, maybe I'm, I'm thinking of spark plugs. Yes. <laughs> those those don't really exist anymore. You know, back in the days, I, I knew how to change spark plugs, uh, but uh, there, there are certain parts to certain machines that are, well, you think of cross-platform. You can use Word on a Mac. You can use Word on a PC, right? It's cross-platform. And what that's basically what Triple IF is. It just works on everybody's different platform. And it holds a certain standard, an industry standard for a certain quality. Uh, so I, I have really been, I have been challenged to, on both sides, learning it and then trying to explain it. Right. As well, you did a beautiful job. You've done a, a <laughs> I'm going to copy what, how you explained it. My, so. my Japanese students are going to ask me what, the, what the hell is a spark plug, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but M, MS word, they will understand, uh, very well in, in their world. Um, Okay, so let's do talk a bit about, because you do gender, you started in women's studies. Now, women's studies have kind of uh, expanded, let's say, or the, uh, what I see more now from the Tokyo in the in the North America and Europe and whatnot are gender uh, uh, identification uh, uh, considerations that you were doing uh, before it was cool, I guess, maybe. Uh, and uh, we are uh, looking at... Laura, when I was in high school, I know it's unbelievable. My students won't believe my hair was down to my shoulders and it was just a result. That's the way all of us were. We wanted to grow our hair. Our fathers hated us for it for a period. You know, they loved us deeply, but uh, they just could not bear to look at us, you know, with that long hair. And uh, you get pulled by a cop and you're automatically charged and you better have a better, a good attitude because he doesn't like those long hairs. And, you know, there was just a phase in there that you and I remember. And uh, we go back to any pictures of anybody in the 18th, 17th century. You know, men wore their hair long. And then, of course, beards changed. And women do different things to dress and so forth. And it mattered. It was this whole signifying as walking down the street, you know, sumptuary laws, you know, when in class where you're not allowed to dress above your position, the things that we can't imagine now, you know, uh, wealthy, those billionaires I'm talking about, they make sure to step out in a T-shirt with no collar, you know, and try to look as bohemian as they possibly can. Right. So 
you've been looking into some of this in your articles. I think I'm touching on some of the things that you've considered uh, in terms of gender identification in the 18th century and the long 18th century. You know, I actually haven't done that work. So my interest, um, I'm an 18th century romanticist. And um, when I started working on a particular women writers in particular, um, <clears throat> it, it was already being taught at Cornell. Um, marvelous professor Dorothy Merman yes. uh, taught women writers. And that's where I first um got my interest in women's writing and I've been grateful to her, her for ever since. Um, but um, I don't go into that. What I've been more interested in trying to, to think about is the way that um, a new emerging field in digital humanity, well, first of all, the editorial field of digital humanity, so creating digital editions, um, why it's so difficult um, to keep non-canonical women from disappearing uh -huh. in the digital, just the way they disappeared in the print. So I have an uh -huh. article about that, and that's the problem of um, history. Um, but then the other is that um, there are a lot of um, people have jumped into the field of digital humanities currently in the field of cultural analytics, which is text mining. And um, they're they're doing a lot of work on gender differences with text mining. And they, uh, in the process, are not understanding um, the historicity of gender markers. Some of them. Some of them are. Ted Underwood's work is great, and he's very um, conscious of that. Can you give but us an example of, of misunderstanding the historicity of gender marking? If maybe just one kind of objective correlative there. All right. So, yeah. um, you know, um, if you were to um, talk with a woman in 1700 who, um, like, uh, let's say, um, Margaret Cavendish, so maybe a little before, um, about, um, you know, what marked her as a woman, it certainly would not be uh, that she stays home and takes care of the children. Um, that comes to be associated with women later. And um, there's a lot of research on this. And it's um, the most important landmark bit of research was Nancy Armstrong's book, Desire and Domestic Fiction. Okay. But also before that, Mary Poovey um, on uh, The Proper Lady. Um, and so these are, are changing norms. Um, a, a 19th, some, uh, a, um, a woman in one of George Eliot's novels um, couldn't behave in the ways that Margaret Cavendish did, couldn't just hold salons in that way. Um, and so, you know, in the 19th century, um, women who were aristocratic had other ways of being, but women who were decidedly middle class were not holding salons. They were holding classes for their children <laughs> I at see. home. Okay, so when you look into this, when you set up and start doing data mining, you have to be aware of all of these, um, uh, not that subtle, but differences in class structure, also in time. And also you can, let's just, let's just take a middle class urban person over a hundred years, you might find that there's more restrictiveness somewhere in the middle there, and it opens up in some ways, but there are many, many variables in there that if you're not alert critically, as literary critically to it, you don't get those, uh, that, that's not it. That's not part of the code. That's not part of the that's right. uh, architecture of the. That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, to, um, you want to be careful as with any, if you are a traditional literary scholar, and you're gonna start examining gender roles, say in Margaret Cavendish's household. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, well, you know, for us, um, the ideal woman doesn't work. So that's gonna be one of the things that's ideal for her, mm -hmm. right? Neither of them worked. They were not in a class that worked, you know? I mean, it just doesn't make any, any sense to apply our notions of gender to theirs. 
So present, cool. Presentism is a, a form of exactly. presentism, yes. Exactly. So you do yeah. a lot of research into the time, and that's why there's so much great research into Shakespeare's time, Private Life by Lena Orlin. What is private life like? What are people, you know, how do things get um, organized? Um, and, and, and you understand, you, you look at their mode of imposing gender roles and you discuss that. You don't discuss our own on top of them. It's anachronistic. So yeah. you don't want to do that when you're text mining either, right? You don't want to well, say- And you don't okay, want someone doing that to us 400 years from now. Exactly, you know, exactly, yeah. Uh, we'll have our flaws. We'll have the, the, all the things that we did. But you don't want to be effaced as the worst kind of, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's the worst kind of effacing, isn't it? You know, the, the, like in the male dominance model of, uh, you know, stripping people of their rightful identities. You know, it's, a, it's an abuse. <laughs> it's yes. A, 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 a well, it's an erasure for sure. And that's one yeah. of the problems is, is keeping women visible. You know, we don't know. Uh, that there were so many women writing in the 18th century because they had very small print runs and a lot of them were destroyed during the World War II bombings of the British Library, the British Museum at the time. So, you know, you there, there are things that get erased from history and we just want to make sure that that doesn't happen in the digital world too. Right, right. And it shouldn't. There's no reason that it should, but it still is. It's not an AI. It's, it's driven by uh, sentient you know, <laughs> human thinking people. And, you know, I've spent my whole life from kind of a, a Southern male model that I've had to break out of and look around a bit and so forth. But I'm not seeing the same things you and your experience are seeing or someone else and someone else and someone else. Uh, that's why these uh, teams, I think, uh, are ex so extraordinarily good. And this is going to bring me, I'm going to segue here to something that I'm very selfish about. Uh, but you brought it up too. And that is, I want to start with something maybe controversial. And I don't think you're particularly thin skinned uh, because you've been uh, uh, fighting several battles on several fronts throughout your career. I'm sensing from something behind the code behind your resume and your career uh, shows it right for uh, for our audience. It's unimaginable that a guy, uh, let's say uh, a, a young woman or man in graduate school in let's say the early 80s or late 80s or, or let's put it in the mid 80s, uh, to be fair, would walk in with a perfectly gentlemanly professor, wonderfully enlightened guys, kind and good and brilliant as can be. And uh, on, for a course in the novel, right, and say, well, this is these are the novels I selected to look at the history of the novel. And about halfway through his talk, there's a uh, a woman in class who raises her hand and said, "Did any women write novels? <laughs> you know, could we?" And he he gets really nervous and he turns red and he pauses and he realizes at that moment that there are no women on his list. And of course, he's read, you know, Edith Wharton. He's read, he's read X Y Z all, all through, and uh, and, he, and he says, "Well, let's let's do that." So that's the world we began with, where you mm -hmm. would actually teach a class in the history of the Mar and leave out Edith Wharton, leave out one of my favorite authors, uh, Catherine Ann Porter, leave out. I mean, come on, the list just goes on and on. But that's way that's the way it was. Women were out, except Emily Dickinson. She was sort of the uh, token. Right. They came in. Yes. Um, and uh, I think at some point I could I don't want to spend the time to do it. I could show how Fitzgerald uh, pushed out Edith Wharton uh, and Fitzgerald's great, too. You know, both of them. But anyhow, that's where we start. And then we go through and many, many more women get uh, come through. You fought on that front. Then there's the next front. And that is something that people complain about in computer sciences that you can spend your entire career or a large part of your career building things that other people use, right? And the other people who use those things can be reviewing your work and telling you that you are secondary. Your work is secondary, where you know all the way through that they could not have published their books, their articles, without the kinds of stuff that you were building, right? And I come from a bibliographical tradition. Yes. Right? So you're used to that. I am <laughs> I am used to that having to make that argument. I'm in a faculty where I'm a you know, I'm a full professor. I don't have to worry about any of this stuff now, but I worry for the younger people. 
and many of the younger people are women. In fact, the majority in, in our, our immediate literary field in Japan uh, and, and, and not, you know, second language, you know, they're, they're not equipped. Uh, it, some are, but I mean, uh, to do all this, most people are not equipped to do all this literary critic, to, to be the next great master critic, you know, uh, there's only so much room there. And there's such a huge, huge amount of work that needs to be done that could, you know, it's civilization, you know, it's building the cathedral, it's carrying the stone from the mountain and getting it down there for the next guy to chip at and that sort of thing. And I do think that there's still this enormous gap. And I think it goes before digital. It goes back to the old argument between critics and bibliophiles. You know, bibliophiles are just collectors. He said, do you use this guy? You use Pollard and Redgrave. You editor. use the wing. I use, I saw my whole dissertation right there in front of me one day. Like, And if, if Mr. Pollard and Mr. Redgrave, <laughs> you know, the wing, whatever, if they hadn't done their work, I wouldn't have seen anything. That's right. That's right. right. And uh, yeah, and editors so, as well. Editors and bibliographers are considered um, not to be doing, you know, to be providing a service. And that's just not true. And of course, people like yourself and like in the field of bibliography and like Jerome McGann in the field of editing um, have made arguments, you know, that um, <clears throat> that overturn that, that show that editorial work is, um, well, and I'm thinking of D.F. McKenzie in particular. D.F. McKenzie. Um, yeah, um, more than McGann. Yeah. So, you know, the um, those arguments are made and the same arguments have to be made for digital resources. So um, my the, one of the organizations that my center runs, one of our signature projects, the Advanced Research Consortium, we peer review digital projects. I just peer reviewed a manuscript that's been put online and a database has been created around it and it's been TEI encoded. And I argued that it was the equivalent of a monograph, uh, not uh, an addition, but a monograph. Yes. And I think I successfully proved it as yes. the director of ARC sending out a letter um, about this addition. Yes. Actually, I think I was, that wasn't in my position as director of ARC. Um, that was in um, as a, as peer review. Um, digital humanists often have to uh, serve on P and T committees by providing yeah. external letters because the faculty won't know um, yeah. what what's at stake. And so I argued that this is in fact a monograph. Yeah. Um, and um, you know that argument is um, possible to make when something's peer reviewed, when you've um, done the, the the research both into its technology and its content. Uh, you can make that argument, and that's what we do. Well, I have, I, I know you do it, and you do it well where you are. But I sense, and I, I'm, I want to kind of pick your brain on this, that there is out there a residual, I wouldn't call it a hostility, but a feeling among. Uh, people in the humanities that they kind of just wish the digital thing would go away. Mm -hmm. Like we want to use what we can use, but could you just go away? Uh, because mm -hmm. it makes us nervous, uh, all of these acronyms and that kind of thing. And it's not literature, let's just face it, right? And I think in 1965, that the critics who were writing what they hoped would be the next great revelation of, on uh, Alexander Pope's poetry, right? looked across the uh, hallway at the guy who was assembling, you know, the bibliographies and so forth and going, well, that guy's just, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of in our, in our view, he's not much, you know, he's not a real thinker. And that guy's over there. We know he's thinking, he's got an in index thing. He is building an architecture that perhaps has more um, viable and uh, uh, certainly more permanent um what we would call uh, abstract reasoning, right? If you're looking for abstract reasoning and things, and this guy who publishes his book might, may get uh, well-received for about 10 years, and then he's forgotten. There's another, and guess where we go when we're building our database? You know, I can, you can name people, I can name, if you can, well, we went back to Furnace, right, for Shakespeare, but uh, we always go right back there. Uh, and, and these people, these names that don't disappear, that we're still using, and they're not the critics. They were the people who uh, did this this kind of work, archival work and so forth. And then you get the people like you and also Lena, uh, who 
uh, uh, really do uh, kind of both, can do both. Uh, but it's yeah. time consuming, it's time consuming. And a young person should be able to advance through the right ranks that way, if so, if, you know, if that person chooses to, uh, to do so. Right. Well, you know, um, people say, oh, you know, the digital, it won't really matter. It's it's not part of what um, humanists do. Um, but when you search in your library, you don't rifle through the stacks. And I bet you're not opening a card catalog d drawer. I bet you're online. Oh, that's that's right up there with the spark plugs for my, my kids. What's right. a card catalog? The when things that used to give you paper cuts when you were searching for books, right? Yeah. Right. And you're searching... When you're when you're writing your article, you're doing it in Word and you're doing Google searches. So um, Katie Trumpener, who's probably one of the most well-read literary critics I have ever seen, maybe except for Northrop Fry, um, she um, a, wrote a response to Franco Moretti um, to his work that's digital. And in it, she said, Oh, you've ignored this and you know, you've made a database, you've done this database and you've searched this database. But you've completely ignored um, what title pages look like. She says, you can't use a database to figure out what title pages look like. She says, I Googled it and I found. Well, bum -bum. <laughs> Google is the biggest database on the face of the earth. And all we want to do is give you a better one. All we want to do is give you one that will give you more what you need. Right. And um, so there's no escaping you know we are digital yeah. and i think the the reality is that people have to get jobs and that jobs uh, now are asking for digital humanists everybody wants at least one member of their faculty who does digital humanity so they can at least explain to them what the heck is going on so uh you know and i'm doing p t for those uh, when i left miami Digital Humanities um, was supported up to a, an extent, but when I wanted to become a manager of a center, a director of a center, it wasn't. And so, um, but they hired another digital humanist in my place. You know, everybody has to have one. Yeah. So uh, all of this work is not going to be unrewarded. Uh, and um, it's just here. <laughs> yeah, but I do remember back in the 90s, Gerald, Gerald Graff making the, uh, showing how, okay, we need critical theory and, uh, and nobody wants to learn anything new. They want to stay where they are. So we just hire the critical theorist and we take care of that and everybody can stay in their, in their box. Right. And he was arguing for more <laughs> cross platform, you know, the digital humanists can help out the 19th century specialists who can help out the digital, you know, the, there's so many, and I think many people see that. And I well, and the, the reality is, is you're a professor, you publish your book, you're a traditional humanist, but you're using all these online materials and you say to yourself, you know, if only, if only there were this online. So I see so many traditional faculty coming to the digital humanities all the time, because what has to happen, you know, if, if all that's digital is just a PDF online nobody's going to want it at all. You, all you want to do is find it and print it. Yeah. But as it becomes more, as it's able to return graphs to you, as we're able to show you all the interaction, the network of interactions among characters in a play through a network graph, um, as we're able to add these things that people will, when they're publishing their research in articles and traditional articles, say, I made a network graph, this is what I saw. If you're, if you're, if that becomes part of the research that's being done, then you will see everybody will participate, and that's happening. Yeah. Well, I see this, and I also uh, am trying to make a little bit of noise about the world between uh, not everything that is done is as good as say double blind peer review article in a major journal but the next value below that isn't zero <laughs> you know, well there, and there the, is... the peer review process for these digital projects 
uh, the editorial boards are as illustrious as Cambridge University Press. Oh, so I've seen them. But I'm talking about, for instance, an example, I won't get into too much detail, but as someone I know who curated a, an excellent, curated an excellent project having to do with Shakespeare and a connection with uh, out of a university that is not yours or mine. And um, and I uh, did it for the love of it. And I remember asking her, I said, what, well, you know, uh, I knew she was looking towards promotion because she wasn't quite a full professor yet. Uh, and uh, I said, to, you know, what do you, do you get any kind of, just a few little markers for spending so much time on this exquisite thing that is public outreach. It does all, all of it. And she goes, not a bit, not zero. It's just something I wanted to do. I'm thinking, all right, if you give the peer review a value of 10, you, we can argue over whether it should be two or four or three or whatnot, but zero <laughs> just yeah. doesn't, you know, and I think we've been assumed uh, somehow by the scientific model. Well, I, I want to push back a little bit on what you're saying here, yeah. because um, if she did this labor of love and she wasn't participating in the field of digital humanities, which has standards like TEI and um, rules about database design and all of these things, well, it might just be trash in five years. And so that database needs to be peer reviewed before it's anything. So we have just, we have just at ARC rejected a project that got uh, funding by, um, in the UK, it was uh, first sponsored by the Huntington, but it those images aren't on IIIF servers, and who knows if they're going to be there in two years. Oh, yeah. Now, we're talking within the digital realm. Yeah, I was outside uh, of that. Um, as I should use another example. If a faculty member puts on a play uh, or writes a play, I'm, I'm uh, writing a recommendation right now, and uh, if, uh, how much credit does a person get for writing and producing a play that's played and then it's gone. Now they, they do record it, but you see, I don't think the value should be zero. And well, I don't think it is for people who are directors or artists, right? right? If, right. if you have exhibits world. and, and it's not certainly not if you're a creative writer and you publish. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, but, but in this case, you can actually get a document for the P and T committee that tells yeah. you exactly what this work is. It's worth two articles. It's worth yeah. such and such. You know, it's the equivalent of this. So, um, you know, because what, if it just looks like a service item, if it doesn't seem to have any original research in, into it, the original research is in the field of digital humanities. And mm -hmm. it may be there and it may not, but mm -hmm. you need a digital humanist to say what it what it is. Yeah. So, so it's, um, you know, it's definitely something that can be counted by P&T committees. Uh, it's not something that that locally um, in each department. And I've published on that. I pu published an open letter to the English department um, when I first got here. But this English department was already very advanced at Texas A&M. Um, so they didn't really need it. But other people have wanted no, I've seen it. it. I've read it. That's that's why we're talking about this now, because it hits a nerve out there. And we might be um, narrow, narrowing uh, this a little bit. too. This might be a little bit too inside a family dispute or something like that. But really, it isn't because it, it, it's the uh, it's the way of survival, not just in the humanities and digital humanities, but all the way across the board, Absolutely. because you have to you have to give young people a chance. To, to do stuff. Uh, Laura, we could talk about this forever and a day, and I wish that we had more time to talk about every one of these items. We didn't get through our agenda, but I think we got through a lot, and I think this is a good beginning for people who don't know about the kinds of work that's being done at A&M, the work that you're doing to find work that's, that's being collaborated all the way across the world, the Shakespeare Variorum and all of this stuff. I know that just looking at your record that you are a busy, busy, busy person and that you have to go. And so do I. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. A deep bow from Japan, from Tokyo. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. This has been delightful. Thank you.